Colony brings the X-Files back to hardcore mythology stories. We're about two-thirds through season two, when the show had really seen its popularity explode. So this one starts with a reminder of what set Mulder on this path in the first place, the disappearance of his sister from their home when they were both children. He assumed it was aliens, but the way he now phrases it opens up other possibilities, unstated ones. I assume he means the government, but I suppose goblins wouldn't be out of the question. Incidentally, I wrote that line as a gag, but then I thought about it. I thought about the X-Files, so I did a Google search. Turns out that there is a novel of that name that is associated with Mulder's sister, no less. So now, I'm not sure that's a joke so much as possibly hitting the bullseye while blindfolded. While he's talking about that, the abduction, not the goblins, we see Mulder being delivered by the military to some remote outpost where he's being treated for hypothermia. So, while the fullest limits of Western medicine are put to the test by putting Mulder in a bathtub, Mulder's narration says that at least now he knows the truth. Aliens live among us, have begun to colonize our world, and are going to inflict something upon us called reality television. Scully shows up frantic, insisting that the cold is the only thing that's keeping the foxicle alive, and cue medical crisis and the titles. We return to two weeks earlier when a research ship in the Arctic spots a UFO, which hovers and then crashes, which, you know, explains Roswell. Aliens don't actually know how to land their ships, they just aim at the ground and count on the insurance to sort it out. The news reports that it's actually a Russian pilot that they pulled out of the ice, but one of the doctors watching the news spots him, he runs off. Well, this guy is fast. He goes from being on TV to being in the stairwell in seconds, where he grabs the doc. Where is he? And apparently that answer is enough for the big guy, who whips out a spike and stabs the doc in the back of the neck with it, where surge soda begins bubbling out. So, that's where it comes from. Now to find a way to dispose of the evidence. Luckily, this entire building is covered in gasoline. Yes, just a couple of sparks, that's all it takes. Well, this is an abortion clinic, after all. It makes people explode easily enough, so no surprise buildings do the same thing. Mulder happily tells Scully about it the next day, because he got an email about it, along with two identical abortion clinic attacks, where one of the victims of each fire looks like the other victims of the same fire, if you follow me. They're identical. And with no records showing any kind of connection between these guys. In fact, no records at all. So it's time to meet our resident political extremist. In this case, he's a hardcore anti-abortionist. But could just as easily be hardcore PETA, hardcore environmentalist, basically any overly enthusiastic person who hates a place where people wear lab coats. Rules of fiction are always clear on that. They're going to be ridiculously obsessed with the topic during their brief part and extremely hyperbolic in their remarks. And they will always be innocent of the true crime that's involved. But they have to be here because in the boring real world where puppet masters are less like global manipulators than they are people who work at Sesame Street, it's usually those ridiculously obsessed people who are responsible for this kind of crap. Fortunately, we don't have to spend much time with the guy before he points us to the newspaper that has a picture of the victim asking if anyone had seen this person and to call a number if they had. The paper confirms that it wasn't Reverend Burn in Hell that placed the ad, but there's nothing to go on. The guy paid in cash and hasn't been back to pay for the second week that the ad ran. But they still have the messages, one pointing to Syracuse. So Mulder calls up Agent Weiss there and asks for him to check in on a possible victim, well, possible future victim. Weiss shows up only to find the guy having a heated argument with someone, our supposed Russian pilot, again with the spike, only this time the twin doctor is dissolving into a puddle of green stuff. When Weiss sees this, he figures he probably needs to shoot someone, so he picks our pilot friend. Only, the guy doesn't bleed normal either, and Weiss is the one who starts screaming rather than the guy that he shot. Considering that, he seems pretty nonplussed when Mulder and Scully show up. Well, this is Syracuse, you know. We have to bounce back pretty quickly from the depravity the human race commits in this sick, sick society. Saw some people the other day who put their trash out a half hour earlier than legally permitted. Animals. Ah, but this isn't Weiss. He's nearly naked and stuffed in the trunk of his car. Dead. And the other Weiss transforms back into what I think we can safely call the alien, played by Brian Thompson, the guy you get when you can't afford Clancy Brown. 
Weiss's death causes a shitstorm for Skinner, who calls Mulder back to Washington to enjoy the weather with him. He shuts down the investigation and demands Mulder write a report on it, and he won't accept my dog ate it again, not after finding out that Mulder doesn't have a dog. Scully calls on one of those fancy new cordless phones, the ones that are so compact they're barely the size of a bread loaf. She's calling because someone sent her an email of another of the multi-docs. Trademark. They're here in Washington. She's got a picture and everything. On his way over, Mulder runs into another government agent. I mean, it has to be. He's wearing a trench coat. The guy is Chapel from the CIA, and he says that the men are actually Russian clones, smuggled into the country so that in the event of war, they could disrupt medical services. So that's why they work at abortion clinics. It's work that can draw negative attention, but at least offers virtually no access to their strategic targets. The Russians would have had a better shot if they sent Boris and Natasha into the country holding a bomb that said bomb on the side. Well, now that the Cold War's over, Russia doesn't know what to do with an army of identical abortion doctors, not unless each was smaller than the next one so they could fit them all inside of each other into a big Matroshka doctor. So the answer is to send in a spy killer to take them out, and the U.S. will quietly allow it in return for the cloning technology. Chapel's the one who placed the ad trying to protect them and to expose this state-sanctioned murder. I mean, we have the audio of the order, in fact. The only thing I hate more than abortion are Soviet spies. If you find anyone that's both, well, do what you've got to do, gentlemen. Yes, that's my impression of Ronald Reagan doing his impression of Richard Nixon. Mulder and Scully bring Chapel with them to see the latest of the Gregors, as Chapel calls them, who suspect that they are the ones who have been contacting Mulder. But one side of Chapel sends the Gregor diving through a third-story window onto the pavement below, only to get up and run off. Mulder and Chapel pursue, breaking the laws of physics is a felony here, mister. Well, all those foot chases, the odds are going to catch up to you eventually, so Mulder winds up getting hit by a car as he runs into the street. Not bad, but taking him out of this race. By the time Scully catches up, Chapel, the alien in disguise, has already taken out Gregor, who's bubbling into a green puddle that Scully accidentally steps in. Alien funerals must be really odd. We've brought in the wet vac full of your dearly departed. Did you have a choice of buckets for their final resting place? Oh, no. He always loved the sea, and he asked that he be splashed all over the beach. Scully is having doubts about this case because, well, that's her job, really. But Mulder is convinced the chapel is legit. He checked out the record on chapel, and he's the real thing, so he's going to buy chapel's story. Because what's so far-fetched about a secret army of cloned Soviet abortion doctor spies? Aside of the fact that just saying that sounds like Rush Limbaugh with aphasia. Scully pulls out her shoes, the ones that stepped in that goop, and shows it has been eaten right through the soul. And weirder, Weiss, the dead agent, there's no actual cause of death for him. Somehow his blood just spontaneously thickened into a jelly, but no sign of any chemicals responsible for it. So the question for us is, do we file this one under Satanists, Voodoo, or Aliens? Clones seems to mean aliens, but let's not sell short the Horned One or zombies here. Mulder gets called into Skinner's office, but it's not over the report. Uh, your father's been trying to reach you. There's been a family emergency. It seems they just realized they named you Fox. They're not sure what they were thinking. After a quick call, he heads out, leaving Scully alone to check out a new lead, one which is going to cost her another pair of shoes. Inside is Chapel, smashing up tanks and squishing the contents with disgust, so Scully runs off, calling up Mulder and leaving a message that she might be in trouble. But Mulder's long gone. His father and mother have just been reunited with Samantha, his long-lost sister. She says that after she was taken, she was placed with a family who had raised her, having no memory of the life from before that. She later learned of what had happened and is here now because the alien is actually a bounty hunter from space and her adoptive parents are the Gregors. We had seen her in the apartment with the one that had t taken the header out of the window before. She had slipped away and presumably gone unnoticed during what the FBI refers to as a kerfuffle. She says that she's being hunted too, so Mulder calls up Scully, only he goes to her voicemail. She's out investigating a lead and calls him back, but of course, he's at his mom's house and not at home, so she goes to voicemail. Alfred Hitchcock presents Phone Tag of Murder. She's returned to the lab where she'd seen the alien bounty hunter smashing everything up, and then finds another Gregor. And then three more show up. The last of them, they say, and they need some protection. 
So Scully has them placed in protective custody. No visitors, no press, no anybody. Can do. Meanwhile, Mulder has returned home and gotten the dozen or so messages from Scully and calls up the motel where she is, only she's out, and the doofus working the counter forgets the details of the terribly important message that he was supposed to give her. Well, at least we can be sure the government will handle this stuff properly, though. I'm going to talk to the prisoners. Yep, no visitors at all. I should go visit them to make sure that no one is visiting them. Can't be too careful. Yes, this is the alien bounty hunter, and the government has conveniently put them all in one place and locked them up so they can't escape their certain murder. Or as we call it, protective custody. While the keys to her case are being slowly murdered, Scully has been showering, missing a call on her cell from Mulder. But that's all right, because he shows up at the door. And to show just how concerned he is about Scully, he also calls her on the phone at that very same moment. Now that is considerate. What does it mean? And will there be voodoo? The answer comes in our next chapter, Endgame. Trust no one, Mulder. I changed it to trust everyone. I didn't tell you.